and hello to you all. I hope it's okay. I've turned off my video. It uh, makes my signal strength a little stronger coming to you via satellite internet. It's a real privilege to be part of this discussion today and especially to do so with Mario. You'll see from my title that I think that poultry do have a role to play in our food systems and that they can do so in a sustainable manner. However, to achieve sustainability, I believe that we are going to have to take a much more One Health approach to the food systems transformation process. Mario succinctly outlined the problems we are facing in our increasingly small planet. So far, food systems analyses have tended to focus on the food produced for and eaten by humans. Of course, that is only part of the story. And to achieve the 12th Sustainable Development Goal of responsible consumption and production, we are going to have to look at the whole picture. For example, we need to take into account the increasing numbers of companion animals and the food they eat, all the way through to issues such as how we manage our soils and the consequences of the dominance of the English language and how that influences our thinking. This discussion is focusing on poultry. Widely regarded as an amazing success story, as Mario outlined, in terms of growth in production and a reduction in sale price over the past 70 years. As with most things in life, if you concentrate on quanti quantity, then quality may take a second place. In terms of nutritional advice for people, poultry is frequently one of the meats most commonly recommended. However, the broiler bird of the 1970s when chicken meat was recommended to reduce cardiovascular disease has been found to be significantly different to the broiler of the 21st century. This change is reflected in current dietary messaging, suggesting that when preparing poultry, the skin should be removed and visible fat trimmed. In fact, many urban consumers, especially in high income countries, are buying only the breast muscle. And you can see my question regarding this recommendation. In a world with increasing pressure on our natural and agricultural resources, does it make sense to raise and feed a whole bird and then only eat a portion of it? Previous question leads into how we allocate scarce food resources, or perhaps the question should be, how are we currently allocating scarce food resources and how could we do it better? A modeling study led by the Tufts University Nutrition School tracked protein, vitamin A, iron and zinc across a range of plant and animal source food. They studied these particular nutrients because the shortages of them have been identified as the major causes of hidden hunger or micronutrient deficiency. And these researchers used data available on the FAO website to do so. As you can read, they stated that their modeling indicated that there was no nutritional case for feeding human edible crops to animals. However, my understanding is that where animal source food is concerned, the FAO database provides information on dressed carcasses, that is just the muscle and the bones, with offal not being taken into account. This prompts me to wonder if the results would have been the same if all edible parts had been considered. In terms of competition for, for scarce nutrients, of course, it's not just a battle between people and poultry for plant and animal source food. The rapid growth in aquaculture has resulted in increased competition for these same resources. And it's not just farmed animals that we should consider. With increasing urbanization of the human population has also come a significant increase in the number of companion animals. And as cat lovers will tell you, Cats are very fussy about what they eat. And that's suggested by this illustration of a popular cat food containing tender liver and chicken feast. The Tufts modeling study presented in the previous slide su suggested the importance of the micronutrients, iron, zinc, and vitamin A and the macronutrient protein. As I mentioned, most information on carcass nutrients relates to the dressed carcass where offal, such as liver, has been removed. So far, there would seem to be a lack of robust studies into the proportion of edible carcass parts entering the human food chain. 
and the nutrients lost when those parts are not consumed. These heat maps prepared by Hilary Chan, one of my hardworking students, looks at the distribution of key micro and macronutrients across the body of a chicken. On the left, the red in the center of the chicken is indicating that the highest concentration of iron is in the giblets, mostly in the liver in this case. From the table on the right, you can see that giblets are also high in zinc, vitamin A and folate. These are nutrients crucial to the nutrition of children and their mothers. This table also helps to illustrate that animal source food provides many key nutrients, all in the one food, if you like, it's nature's original vitamin supplement. The other key point about this food is that it, is that it contains all of these essential nutrients in a relatively small serving. And this is important for children and for women in their third trimester when gastric volume is restricted. As we all know, competition for nutrients between people and animals is felt unequally across nations and even within households. The 2019 State of the World's Children Report published by UNICEF highlighted that almost 60% of children worldwide are not consuming much needed nutrients from animal source food. The graphic on the left shows the percentage of children globally aged six to 23 months consuming the different food groups listed. And as for our fat fear line here on the right reminds us, social and economic inequity is a considerable contributor to this problem. So why, you might ask, have I brought cats into this discussion? Well, it's one way of discussing why different species consume different types of food and what this means for agriculture and the environment. This table seeks to illustrate how the anatomy of the digestive system affects the type of food required to adequately nourish our bodies. I've selected sheep as an example of a herbivore as their body weight is more or less similar to that of an adult human. One of the big differences lies in the length of the intestines with sheep intestines being around 25 meters long and human intestines are mere six meters. This gives sheep an edge when it comes to absorbing nutrients and water. In the omnivore category, we see both humans and chickens. This means that we both eat a mix of plant and animal source food but it doesn't mean that our diet should necessarily consist of the same food. If we think about the diet of the jungle fowl from which our chickens are descended, it's very different to the average human diet. And all the way to the right is our cat, an obligate carnivore, and it needs a diet largely based on animal source food for good health. This last slide is a little busy, so sorry about that. But I wanted to be able to illustrate three of the different poultry production systems that are commonly practiced. Clearly these three photos come from family farms and not large scale commercial units. On the bottom left, we see many indigenous chickens scavenging for their own feed under an extensive system. This flock belonged to a community vaccinator and mixed farmer in Mozambique. We saw the number of birds increase significantly once vaccination against Newcastle disease became a regular event. These agile and smart birds eat things we'd never dream of eating, and they transform them into highly nutritious eggs and meat. In the middle is a semi-intensive systems where birds roam free for much of the day and receive supplementary feed in the compound where they roost overnight. This particular farm is a farmer initiated cooperative in Tanzania, bringing together a number of smallholder indigenous chicken farmers who sell their eggs in nearby markets. Farm on the right is an intensive layer unit in Lao PDR. In this case, the layers are caged and eat only a prepared ration. Each of these systems are adapted to specific agroecological zones and provide an income and food and nutrition security for the households involved. For birds that are raised intensively, there is an increasing interest in identifying feed ingredients to replace corn and maize especially those that can be produced locally, including insects. This diversity of production systems is a reminder that poultry have been part of human society for a very long time. They are amongst the earliest species domesticated by humans around 8,000 years ago, 
and they still play multiple roles at the household level in addition to food and nutrition security. Poultry, especially indigenous poultry, are central to many cultural ceremonies. They are frequently the only livestock over which women have some control and they help households to build their social capital within their communities. Finally, as we move into this new decade, there are many significant challenges ahead. It is crucial that researchers, policymakers, farmers and other value chain actors work together to better understand and manage the unique landscapes that underpin our food systems and the health of our planet. Thanks so much for your attention and I'm really looking forward to your questions.